We're not going to be defined by a moment. Do not let yourself be defined by a single action. We're going to win through continued excellence over time. Greatness is not born, it is made. Individuals, teams, brands, agencies. I think the ones that have a healthy obsession and find space to play, they're the organizations that are going to win. Brands that don't, well, maybe the best thing you can do is just stay quiet. Why not Tiger? She's always telling everyone what to do. Be quiet. You see what I mean? Let people who do have a platform and have a voice say their thing. I think what organizations should do going into 2024 is this week's Memes and Machines has the return of the legend. Cathal Catman Catty is back. And he came out firing. We talked about Google Gemini, why this was one of the most spectacular product announcements ever, and why they received criticism. We discuss the ethical responsibility of marketeers to not embellish the truth of their product and services. How far should we go to sell something? We talk about reading the room and why as a brand you need to be incredibly self-aware. We then discuss trust. How do you gain it? Particularly as a new organization and what are the strategies and tactics you should apply if you are new in the world? And finally, we conclude with our 2023 marketing reflections. The things we have learned, the things we have tried to forget, and the things we have more conviction in. And to conclude, we look ahead. 2024 predictions. What do we think's coming up? What's going to die? And where should you as a marketing team pay attention? This is the number one podcast to understand what we should be doing next year. I think you just cut off and this should be the number one podcast. I mean, don't. I thought you were just going to stop that. I thought you were just like, I am back. I'm just going to just start propagating false news. It's so fake news. This is the number one podcast. Tune in or else. <laughs> like, subscribe. Catman, great to see your face. It feels like an eternity. It's been two weeks, but it feels longer. I know. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed last week's episode, probably probably our best episode yet, but um, that's okay now, I've got some work to do make, to make sure I keep my place. you got to play catch up. This is, this is memes and machines. We move fast, we break things, we raise the bar. Every cliche marketing team to motivate someone will say those words. <laughs> how's the, um, uh, how's we, the end of the year looking for you? No, oh, chaos. Like chaos. Um, I'm actually feeling a little more festive. Had a, you know, when you near the end of the year, particularly in an organization or any startup, really, you're doing your best to do your projects and your teams justice and end as strong as you can commercially, but also the work that you do. And then you're also trying to plan ahead. So okay. we're in that we're in that juncture between trying to be as effective and productive as we possibly can be at end of year, but also let's be ready for next. So um, I can't say we've put enough effort into being ready for next, but that's the fun of this thing, right? You kind of you know all of that stuff. So yeah, it's good, man. But I'm looking for we have our Christmas party tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to that celebrating with the team. Uh, I imagine if you saw heads the day after, that should be fun. Yeah, I'm curious how you, how you think about how do your clients think about marketing on Christmas? I, I hope they don't think off. about it. I just I hope they don't. I hope they spend time with their families. They do all the things that you should do at Christmas. Take a break. They deserve it. All our clients deserve a, a long break where they don't think about emailing. No, I'm joking. Um, it depends, right? We. Uh, we we have a a heavy exposure to D to C companies, so organizations that sell things online, and we have a heavy exposure to technology businesses. So on one end of the spectrum, technology companies um, will probably take a meaningful break, right? So we, as long as we're prepared and meet our obligations, um, 
I would say on the D to C side of things, a little more challenging. It's, it's still, we're in Q4. It's key trading period for um, a lot of our clients, a lot of our partners. Uh, it's important time of the year. The, the last month of the year is usually symbolic of how next year is going to start, right? So yeah, it's a tale of two halves in our organization. Um, but what we are trying to do across the business as best as we can is um, most, the majority of the office will be shut across Christmas. And I think with the days this year, it falls quite nicely. So um, I'm hoping everybody just takes the time, gets the down downtime they need and just comes back firing. There's nothing like a January 1st to make people feel like you can reset, set some new ambitions, some new goals, all that type of stuff. Yeah, completely agree. It's weird being in a, again, a software business where we're, we're you know, we have a global, t- uh, global um, customers. Not everybody is mm-hmm. celebrating Christmas and it doesn't necessarily mean we can switch off, right? So a lot of the work leading up to Christmas is how do we make sure we're like scheduled and we're fully in a good place. But I think a lot of people um, shut down for three weeks and they actually probably lose a lot of traction or lose a lot of growth it- if you're you know running certain types of business. So you got to set, set up in a way that balances keeping your team sane but also, you know, not losing the momentum and the compounding growth that you've gained throughout the year. Yeah, it is interesting where we draw these arbitrary lines. You're in the US though, because yeah. you kind of have two Christmases. You have this big stalemate mm. that is Thanksgiving. What's that? That takes out. It really takes out a week because people plan yeah. holidays, they travel, and then what? Within three or four, three or four weeks, you're back at Christmas. I tend to view in the US when it, when I was living there. It didn't feel as big as it does in the UK. Am, am I right in saying that? Christmas, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, definitely not. It's it's because of Thanksgiving, I think you have that buffer. And then, yeah, in the UK, Christmas is the big one. But it's a it's a strange period between Christmas and the Thanksgiving and Christmas here. It's kind of this, kind of this purgatory, but people, might, people definitely go harder for Thanksgiving over here. Yeah. It's cool. I did have my first pumpkin pie just a few years ago and I think we are missing out on some yeah. delicacies they're pretty good yeah sweet potato and uh, marshmallow beautiful good man um, I want to kick off did you see Google Gemini's update I did so Google Gemini um, came out and, and I think everybody It was almost like the return for Google. So with Bard, so uh, ChatGPT's Google competitor Bard came out and I think everyone was underwhelmed. There wasn't kind of this big meaningful launch, let's say. There wasn't the attention around it. It fell a little flat, flat. It was launched as an experimental product. I think from a comms standpoint, they could have done more. Um, But on the other hand, they've got a lot more considerations. When you're Google and you have that authority and that responsibility in the world, it's not easy to ship products that you don't necessarily believe are ready for market. Whereas OpenAI, you know, was quite open about experimenting their way um, and kind of co-authoring with people around the world, right? Um, What was really interesting about the Gemini launch was they came out and everybody applauded. It was quite incredible, the, the product launch where in the most simplistic way it showed how the artificial intelligence can now do things that we didn't think were currently possible things like reasoning you know a step towards a form of general intelligence one of the key barriers is the ability to reason you can only solve problems in a very narrow way if you can't logically work through to the next answer so if you think of state one of AI as being very automation led, you know, you'd take huge data sets, you use predictive patterns and you would automate. The next phase injects some reasoning. And the Gemini launch just did this really simple illustration where the AI is responding to what was happening on the screen. It was someone drawing a duck, I believe. And then they'd like, it reason through the logic of why it was a duck. And then they color it in and say things like, it was colored in purple and it would say the duck isn't 
Um, ducks use, aren't usually purple. So again, it was using logic and reasoning to kind of try and establish what was happening on screen. So I, I watched that and went, wow, I can't believe how fast everything is moving. This is <laughs> incredible. The next day, I start to see all the criticisms of Gemini's launch going, well, actually, a lot of stuff within that uh, within that feature um, was uh, artificially created, meaning, um, you know, they'd, they'd maybe overstated its current capabilities or implied that it can do things that it can't today, right? So the question I ask you, number one, what did you think of the launch and what did you take away from it? And number two, there's a broader question around ethics. How far can we go as marketeers to promote products and services? And should you ever get let the truth get in the way of a really good story? <laughs> I think, I, likewise, when I watched the, the channel, I was amazed. I was like, oh my God, there's... You know, again, we've kind of moved up another level in the AI's capabilities. To be clear with Google, what they'd done is they had edited together sequences. So each individual sequence had happened and the technology could do that. But they had edited, edited it together in a way that made it look like the tool was capable of kind of doing this at this speed and in real time and using the past sequence to contextualize the next sequence. And they also had somebody doing a voiceover speaking to Bard. And um, that wasn't real. So it was somebody typing and then he was just doing a voiceover as if he was speaking to it. Um, so what they had done is, I guess in their justification is that, you know, the actual capabilities are real, just the way that you interacted it with it yes. wasn't quite real. But that's, in, you know, in my opinion, incredibly disingenuous because what made it so impressive was the way in which the person was interacting with this tool and the way that it was spitting answers back it felt like a natural conversation it felt very kind of impressive seamless smooth and that's why it was such an impressive demo actually all of the individual sequences that's a lot of it was technology we've seen already we've seen that kind of that level of ai and so with product marketing when we think about doing these kind of launch videos i mean you know as somebody who produces a huge amount of these product launch videos the animations aren't always 100% close to what the final product is because, you know, we might want to simplify the UI and we might, we might want to bring certain buttons out. We might want to, you know, make it clear what the flow is. And as a result, it, it means speeding up some sequences, speeding up some load times, playing with the animation. But when you watch one of our videos, it's very clear it's an animation. In that video, it is a product demo. He is doing a voice recording. He's, you know, made it as if he's screen recording, right? As he's made it as if you're watching a, a Loom video, a very simple screen recording of his screen. So you can't, you know, create something like that, which is the format is designed to make you think that you're watching a unedited screen recording. You can't then go and superimpose that and, you know, dress it up to make it seem better than it actually is because the context in which people are watching it is if, I'm watching this with no edits, with no super imposition. So, like, um, I think that I think it's a nuanced question with how honest we have to be in our product marketing. And the answer is that it depends in the context of what your viewers are watching it. And in Google's case, it was pretty bad because you know they've been fighting their PR against losing the AI battle, and I don't think that did them any favors. You know what? I'm going to disagree with you on this one. <laughs> I, I think it's a classic case in marketing of selective outrage. Um, almost everything we do is engineered as marketeers. Uh, if you think of how many pieces of content have you seen that are like fly on the wall, hidden camera, when it's literally carefully orchestrated, you know, all the... Yep. Uh, production theater that goes into that everything you describe there around animations um you make a clear distinction um you make a very clear distinction of saying this is obviously animated i would say it's obviously animated to you i think if you showed it maybe not your you've got quite a um let's say 
you've got a very specific target audience. But if I showed that video my parents, they're not going to say that's animated. They're just going to think that's technology, right? So I think we as marketeers often come from a, a privileged place when we say, well, to us, it's obvious, maybe not to the other, to the rest of the world. And I think if we're going to criticize someone like Google, where they've, everything they've done is factual, they've maybe just, I suppose, strengthened or you could go as far as embellished how seamless the interactions are to a degree. Um, I think that's overplaying and um, probably not fair. Um, do I think the net negative for good and like play up risk reward? You're always weighing up risk whenever you put any communication or creative into the world. When I think of the risk reward factor, I actually I cannot wait to play around with Gemini, right? Do you know what I mean? I went off that, even knowing full well they took that further. And maybe I'm biased because I'm just AI enthused and can't wait. But I looked at that and go, I really want to unpick that. And actually, I do think they showed us, to your point, sequencing was factual. The functionality of what they said it could do, it can do. Um, we're what? We're four, five, however many months away before the the speed of processing and like that interaction being a very real one. So yeah, my, my, on a personal opinion standpoint, um, I didn't necessarily see anything wrong with it. I didn't think it crossed the moral boundary. Um However, look, I it's creating debate, right? So um, overall, I say net positive a win. Yeah, it depends what they're. I mean, um, they're releasing a product in, into a market which already has a lot of existing incredible products, and so they release this video. You could actually try it anywhere. You can actually try the the real thing, and so. Um, I think in terms of the reputation, the reputational damage they got within the tech community, which is largely who they're trying to reach here, it was probably in that negative, in my opinion, because it, it I just, I, I just, I can't agree that that, like, if you watch that particular video, I agree that like embellishing some product animations, fine, but that particular video is designed to look like this is a unedited raw stock recording. Like it is just, it is just like from the biggest company in the world or one of the biggest companies in the world, it seems like in order, like if you feel like you have to embellish your product, it probably says something about the final thing. And so I just think reputationally for them, it 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 says more to the progress they're making than anything. Um, maybe maybe they think differently. Maybe you're right. Maybe this reached more people as a result. But it felt like an odd decision to me. Maybe, uh, but if I look at every product launch that I've come across, that I go, "Fucking hell, that's amazing!" It's all nonsense. And and I mean that yeah. in the sense of the pure, it does what it says. If you go on like Adobe, when Adobe Phil came out and they showed the product video that went viral everywhere, of showing within a you know a few clicks I could type um, and recreate and change a scene, or I could expand, um, I could upscale super easily. All these new features um, in the Adobe suite, when you actually use them, they do the outcome, but God, it's not as dynamic and interesting, and it's way slower. So yeah. I, I, I think maybe I'm biased. I, I have a soft spot for Google. So I, I, maybe I'm being biased <laughs> and, and defending them. <laughs> um, but I just think everything I've seen, everything I've championed, everything I've applauded, everything that's created. Because their job right now is to get me to, for me to have enough curiosity to be like demanding the product. You could yeah. argue they have a greater responsibility in the world. Maybe that's a standard that you could hold them to, and I, I think that's a fair critique. But personally, I just went, I'm goddamn excited. Fair. There's our debate yeah. of the week early. Done. We're out. Um, <laughs> I, do, I, I did want to kind of build on that point, though, because I think something I'm seeing a lot, I'm seeing quite a few marketing misses. So I find it really interesting this time of year when there's all these big moments, whether it was Black Friday and everyone's vying for your attention, we're playing the attention at all costs games where we're trying to just interrupt people's day and just get that little bit of cut through. We've seen it a lot with Out of Home. We see it in the battle for Christmas um, notoriety. 
We've seen it time yep. and time again. And one I, when I saw a reason that I thought was funny was Colgate. Colgate are getting uh, some heat for working with a creator to promote teeth whitening. And like, there's nothing wrong in working with a creator to, to, to promote a teeth whitening toothpaste. Nothing wrong with that. But what they haven't done is kind of read the room and they did this very overt, you need Colgate white toothpaste for Christmas. It'd be the perfect Christmas gift. And okay. the reaction from the internet, what do people do? As you can imagine, they go, if you buy me toothpaste for Christmas, we are over. If anyone in my family buys me toothpaste, it is finished. We're never speaking again. So um, people kind of had outrage. And I, I think there's a broader point of brands um, failing to read the room, knowing the tactic, kind of having the objective. We're seeing it a lot, actually, in creator marketing. Um, I think it may have been, it might have been M&S, and they basically put out a piece of, um, Christmas content and part of that Christmas content was the like Christmas cracker colors it was like green red and another color um, and it effectively was like a, a burning was it like a party hat I can't remember exactly this is going back a few months but they received a lot of backlash because the context of the world is there's a tragic war happening on the border or, or within yeah. Israel and Palestine. And um, people associated the burning with Palestine. Um, I actually think that was just a genuine mistake and um, maybe some of those criticisms were unfair. Um, but it does raise a broader point to me about brands having to read the room today and be more self-aware than ever before. Um, how do you, what systems do you put into your marketing efforts to ensure that you show up in the world in the right way and only speak on topics that are, you know, relevant for you to speak on? Because, you know, we all make mistakes. I mean, I think there's some, like, harmless pieces, right, where, like, telling your audience to buy toothpaste for Christmas. There's no, da- there's no bad da- brand damage there. There's no, like, negative thing to your reputation. If anything, there's just some, like, positive jokes about people getting bored toothpaste for Christmas at the end of the day they're you know furthering themselves as a, as a market leader I don't think it's gonna prevent people from buying Colgate because of that ad but um I think that if anything it was probably engineered from their side to get that reaction um I think on the other piece it's it's very difficult it's I think really knowing your place right like I think we've seen in the past you know, with other big social movements, other big world events, I'd say there was probably a peak mid 2010s, especially mm-hmm. with COVID, where we had this belief that brands had to have a voice for every single social issue that ever happened, right? Where there was this almost overcorrection of um, uh, of responsibility to mm-hmm. be seen to be, you know, saying the right things or doing the right things, and I think. I think people started to really feel that overcorrection. I think when COVID happened and then you maybe had some um, uh, some cultural issues that were happening in America, I remember at the time, and you had, you know, to your earlier example, a teeth whitening company weighing in on a race debate, for example. And <laughs> it just didn't feel like it was necessarily a place that they had anything to add to the conversation. And if anything, it just felt like they were using the social conversation to further their brand awareness or further their messaging. And I feel like we're seeing a bit of a pullback now where um, brands that that do have a valuable um, contribution to the conversation are showing up in a meaningful way and brands that don't, well, maybe the best thing you can do is just stay quiet and not say anything and let people who do have a, a platform and have a voice you know, say that thing. And so um, I think it's just really understanding where you have, where you bring value to the conversation. And then there's always this arrogance brands have where it's like, oh, I have to say something. I have to be seen to be giving a statement about this. But unless it affects you in your business or it affects your customers or even your employees in some meaningful way that you feel like you can bring some valuable contribution to the conversation, my general belief is it's best to just not say anything. Yeah, and... 
you know, you know what? I I have serious empathy for organizations that feel the pull um, to to join, and and there's been some, I suppose, seen as somewhat controversial decisions where leaders in large organizations have come out and said, "We will not be political," and you know they've faced backlash for for taking a let's say a neutral stance on really important issues. Um, I I think the key for me is always guided by doing things for the right reasons and being authentic to self. So if you are Patagonia, you know, your entire brand DNA is built around social cause, creating a more sustainable future, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. So, you know, there there are moments in the world where you have such an authentic an authoritative voice that you have an opportunity to join those conversations that are much bigger than any one brand. Um, but I think the point you raise is when things happen in the world and you're either A, not doing them, if you're not doing them for the right reasons, number one, that's a sin. If you're not, yeah. do, if you're doing them and they're not authentic to you in some way and that can be that it really represents your team or your people or the products or your services or your customers take it in that set it, whichever field you want to cover um and then i think there's a there's a, a more practical point that i think what organizations should do going into 2024 is they need to spend the time really thinking who they are in their common language I've become obsessed with how do you create continuity across teams, meaning if you can speak to a team member at one part of an organization in a different country, in a completely different role to someone at the other side of the world, in a different role, in a different country, and you ask them questions about an organization, if they can give you a similar answer, it means you as a company know exactly who you are. You've created a common language that's infiltrated everything you do um and i think that's the i suppose that's the outcome of two things a really clear complete clarity um and what manifests in creating a really strong brand so um yeah my one of my bigger lessons i think and i think about this for flight story but also our partners is how do we how do we have complete clarity in the world and it often starts at home, deciding who you are. And you said it before, like who you're not, what are you not going yep. to speak on? Um, and that's a very strong objective framework. That means when you have the societal pull, the outrage that often exists on social media, all the negative bias that humans have, that one comment that, you know, offends us and makes us have that knee jerk reaction. If you know yourself, you can have those objective frameworks. And um, I think if ever there is a good time to do it, it's right at the start of the year to do those exercises or the end of the year, right? Figure out who you are and be relentless and clear um, as you go into 2024. Love it. Um, dude, I, I want to build on that point, actually, for 2024. Um you're 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 effectively a, a new organization it probably doesn't feel new it probably feels like a lifetime but like both flight story and third web have been around for like two years we, okay. we're, we're two years old right um how do you think about like building trust for your for your brand and your company and i i asked you that specifically because for anyone that isn't aware, Third Web is in Web3, and Web3 is a nascent industry. It's new, it's often complex, it's had a communication problem as a sector, um, it's full of bad actors, or has been historically, a lot of negative press. And the number one challenge for any new organization operating in a new industry is building trust. Um how do you think about that and what actions have you been taking over the last two years to to build trust with your users it's a great question i'd say like i mean there's a million kind of tactical things but the overall overarching statement i'd say is just 
act like a big company, right? So like, you know, we're a startup with, obviously we're, we're 50 people now, but when we started, we were, you know, five or six of us. And I'd say from a marketing and, and communications perspective, it was always how do we behave or how does everything that we do reflect as if we are a 100 person, 200 person company. And that means, you know, over indexing on having polished design and cohesive branding, copywriting. And I, I think like one of the most underrated things you can do to build trust is just by writing good copy. Uh, if you if you see like a new startup or a new company and they're, you know, they've got spelling mistakes and their writing doesn't flow and it's just, you know, not quite there. There's always this immediate, oh, okay, these guys are amateurs. Because it can go either way with a startup. You know, you're either looking at the next billion dollar unicorn or you're looking at something that's going to fizzle out. And I think people make those decisions subconsciously the minute they look at any external facing communication from a company. And so being very tight and being intentional with everything is really important. And I think just having an incredibly high quality control when it comes to producing any work just prevents you from producing stuff that makes you look like you are the size that you are. Because yeah. if people knew it was five guys in a room kind of crazily making it up as they go along, then, <laughs> well, you probably wouldn't trust them. And so there's almost this need to play a role, to fake it until you make it. Um, and I think that's really how you build trust. But then obviously doing great work is the other thing. And talking about that great work in a in an impactful way, I think that builds trust over time. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I like the way you phrase that. And you're basically implying you know, be the company you aspire to be in many respects. And yep. um, I I think in a, in a practical sense, if you're a new organization, if you're a startup and you know one of the biggest hurdles you have to come or the two biggest hurdles you have to come is awareness. No one knows who you are. And the second one is trust. Both equally yep. as important. They may know who you are, but they don't trust you. And I I, I tend to agree. Every customer user facing touch point has to feel a million dollars yeah, so if you're a service-based business and you send a, a creds deck that is all scrappy and not designed well you know you're not going to have trust i'm not going to see the standard of what you're capable for and that may not be a fair reflection on you as a service provider if you're a technology company and you know you're standing for the future but you don't look like you stand for the future or there's something clunky or like even take how to get in touch with you is a clunky UX. Yep. Um, and you might say like, we're focusing on building the main product and all that stuff doesn't matter. And I actually think that's a very dangerous view to have. I think you have to have very high standards and probably higher standards than the competition in every respect. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm the biggest believer in paying attention to things that maybe your um, contemporaries aren't paying attention to, like making sure you show up on the internet in the perfect way, making sure you have exceptional creative and content way beyond maybe your maturity in years. Um, and actually, I, I'd say there's a third part that it's almost self-fulfilling tides rise and i think when you set a really high standard early and obsess over these things it's very rare that an organization will regress in yeah, terms right. of how it shows up in the world so i think if you focus and i think that that's that's hard for a lot of organizations imagine you've just done a seed raise and you know you've raised two hundred and fifty thousand pound and you've got to pay your team and that's going to cost you one hundred and fifty thousand pound for the next six months you don't yep. have a lot there to start to go, well, we need to have the most amazing website or we need to, you know, make sure we have this, um, uh, we have this like really cool introductory video that our sales team use that describes what we do. Um, I, what my advice for like those, those founders or anyone in that predicament is I tend to view actions and tactics through the lens of how long will they live? So, for example, if you're doing a piece of like hygiene social content that's just going to be here one hour, disappear the next day, um, then, yeah, maybe don't invest your resource and time and efforts in, in, in <laughs> like spending capital in that way. However, if you're having a website 
or something that has what I call a, a long life cycle, spend a hell of a lot of effort on those things because um, the optics around them really do matter. And you may not get the awareness necessarily, but you you are addressing one of the first problems, which is always trust. Yeah, we... Yeah, I don't know. Speaking to our founder recently, I think he put it really nicely where it's, he said that we're not going to be defined by a moment or a launch or like one single thing that's going to make us win as a company. It happens for some companies, but most, most companies it doesn't. But we're going to win through continued excellence over time and doing that at a, at a longer time horizon than, than most other people. Um, because most people won't do things consistently at a high quality over a long period of time. And to do it sustainably. I think there was this like, you know, previous belief in startup, you know, the startup world. It was all about move fast, break things, go crazy for a year. And yes, that works. But in a lot of cases, people just burn out and they get, they, they fall out of love with the problem, the challenge that they're trying to face. People leave because there's internal politics. It doesn't work sustainably. But actually, you need to build a business that you could just do things with excellence over five, 10 years, and then you've, you know, that trust falls into place. And so I think having a longer time frame than, than most people is a big thing. Yeah. It was interesting when you were describing that as, um, what do you think of, what do you think of, um, how the world rejects perfection today? No. Um, because trying to be perfect is, there was a saying I heard from <laughs> Funnily enough, an MMA, MMA fighter called Chael Sonnen. And it, he, I think he released a book called, like, Being the Bad Guy or Bad Guy Inc. And he, he was referencing wrestling and the heel, which is a persona. That's the bad guy that plays the, um, you know, the person that people don't like, the nemesis. And uh, the point that he tried to make was when everyone in the world is trying to be the good guy, loved, admired, revered, the better space to play in where you can get more attention is being the place that, being in the place that very few dare tread, you know, the bad guy. And I think that's an extreme example. And we've, we've referenced Ryanair before of doing that exceptionally well, you know, being very self-aware, knowing who they are, not, you know, anchoring to their value proposition, which is value at all costs, no frills, and then just showing up in the world in this like in this very particular way, right? Um yeah. but what do you what do you think more broadly about um this kind of age where for the longest time brands and marketeers pretended everything was perfect and now there's something really compelling about like being flawed, not being perfect. Um, yeah, kind of goes. It kind of goes against what we were just saying around like showing up in the most compelling way or putting effort in. But I, I want to just get your take on this this rejection of perfection. I mean, it's, it sounds hand in hand with I think a an aesthetic trend that we see right in in the just the the natural um, evolution of the smartphone and of social media that brought us Instagram, which was a, always a very polished beautifully presented place to, to put photos and to, to market. And as a result, marketing looked like that. It was always very polished. It was influencers looking, you know, very primed and polished and um, perfection was the, the ultimate goal. And then as social media has matured, the way we use it has changed. So people now don't put these perfected filtered photos. It's usually a bit more, you know, behind the scenes, lo-fi. That's the kind of content people want to, consume short form video as broad as that where you know these lower production kind of content is is tends to be what people you know move towards and so there is a place for that but at the same time you know there's also still um a lot of value in brands you know leveraging that perfection it depends the kind of brand they are is i guess like if you're a luxury a luxury brand there probably isn't that trade-off you want to make but i would say in general that there is going to be a rejection of perfection on social media because People became very tired of it. And um, I think enough people saw what perfection actually looked like. When you meet enough people who present themselves having this perfect, polished life and you realize they're actually miserable, um, you learn pretty quickly that 
you learn to reject that and not find that as trustworthy as a trustworthy source of information. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating because when you look at the data, I was reading um I was reading something the other week and it, it basically suggested that the optimal review online, if you take Amazon, is four point six. People will favor a four point six review over yeah. a five star review. And it seems counterintuitive. Of course people should go for the five star review. But in essence they don't. And it, it really speaks volumes about the point you're making. It's um, the pursuit of perfection is often rejected. It's not but, trusted because I think innately we um we all understand that it's a it's a false promise, right? Um and I, I think you're you're going into a, a world where we the online world we should be skeptical we don't know what's real or what's fake we've got marketeers trying to manipulate things you've got half truths full truths various opinions echo chambers um it's difficult to determine you know um what's right and what's wrong and the too good to be true line um i think is amplified in this environment or certainly exacerbated yep. Um, dude, I think a nice way for us to conclude might be to go have a bit of a look back. I can't just believe I'm saying this. I actually did say this week, I said Merry Christmas to a few people. It was funny, this is the first week where what? We're still two weeks out, right? But I said Merry Christmas to at least four people today. So I'm mm -hmm. going to be that annoying person that's going to say it between now and, you know, the next week and a half or whatever. Um, but let's give... Some reflections. I think we'll do two things. Let's give reflections and then some predictions. Um, what have you learned in 2023 when it comes to marketing? Are there any, are there any things that you used to believe and you no longer believe? Or are there things that you have now more conviction in in 2023 um, based on how you've conducted your career? No. Uh, I definitely have renewed conviction in content marketing as the number one strategy that basically any business should employ. That the priority should always be getting really good at creating organic content and figuring out paid distribution as a second priority. Um, because I'm seeing a lot of brands, I think the D2C market is, is very... Um, is a great example of this where due to the you know uh, the diminishing ad returns on various platforms I've seen a huge number of D2C companies go out of business this year because they haven't focused on building a brand that exists outside of their paid marketing effort and they were too beholden to their ability to be able to click a button and get money returning on ads whereas the brands, I think, you know, I like to think of Gymshark as the number one example, who understood organic content, distributing through influencers, every other kind of way of distributing. They were able to have basically no, you know, reduction in their momentum because they built a brand, they built a community, they focused on other areas. And so I think content marketing is the number one priority. And then secondly, community as being a, a huge reason a huge place that brands should be investing in. Um, and now community is a kind of broad term. There's no one platform that fits that. But I would say having a two-way conversation with your audience is probably the number one thing you can add to your business to just determine that long-term safety over a long, a long time horizon. Yeah, I love that. And um, it's interesting when you raise the word community, everybody's mind goes to different places. I think... Uh, Community has been probably, I think it's been an overused term because we haven't necessarily landed on a common def definition. You think of community, I've, I've heard people will come to us with like community building strategies. And that to me is like as big a question as saying like everything you do as an organization. You may yeah. like say to me, let's build our brand. Okay, that's a massive task. That's everything you do. And it's not just going to end with your marketing efforts. It's going to end with 
your team, your processes, your customer service. It's going to be so expansive. I, and I, I believe the same to be community. But what I think is a community to me is like brands like Gymshark or any that have, um, that you could argue are very community driven is they understand about the feedback loops and co-authoring with people and investing and championing and they almost adopt this philosophy of caring yeah. um, and that kind of underpins. It's like, we are not going to be successful without you join us in these endeavors. And I think it's more of the community to me has become more of a mindset as opposed to a destination. Like, of course okay. they can, li- you know, community can live anywhere, but it's, um, I, I treat it with the same magnitude of, as someone saying, let's go build a brand, big task. And I think the same as community. But I, I, I agree with everything you said there. And the point you made around content marketing, I think is increasingly important, particularly in the age now where the algorithms, the machines, the role of a paid manager or a media buyer is changing. The platforms do a phenomenal job of auto-optimizing and distributing to the right audiences they yeah. haven't all that hasn't always been the case this is kind of what i'm going to say a rather new phenomenon in particularly social media marketing um and i i think the brands that are exceptional at content marketing will not only see the efficiencies and gains that you will get from having strong content marketing impact their paid efforts but i just think they'll just be ex they'll be 10 times better at paid <laughs> As a consequence mm-hmm. of just understanding how to play organic games. Um, my reflections this year are, are probably reaffirming a few things. And I'll actually speak to something I've changed my mind on. I I always have a soft spot for smart mechanics and tactics that get my attention. You know, I, both of us have spent a long career in social media marketing. And I think we've been conditioned and trained to, to think in formulas. You know, how do we create or write great hooks that stop you in your feed? How do you use context to amplify the impact of a piece of creative? How do we create juxtapositions? How do we use formulas, mechanics, features? We're always we're, we're always thinking about like attention at all costs. And as I as I tend to look forward into the world, I don't see the world becoming less noisy. I think more individuals are going to be creating content more efficiently. So we're going to have more content and more creative in the world, which means in inevitably more ads. The same will be said for organizations and brands and with generative AI tools, just really lowering the barrier for anyone to create mass volumes of, you could call it mediocre, but just lots of content. I actually think what I've reaffirmed is really focusing on longer term storytelling that is deeper that has some real thought um and earns people's attention doesn't just like stop them in their day Mm -hmm. i I could reel off now five to ten hacks that are like tried and tested and like insert brand name and they probably be effective at like gaining maximum reach for that one objective but i i tend to now favor um, or I'm less of a fan of like attention at all cost games. And I don't yeah. know whether that's me getting older or maturing as a marketeer or me appreciating that, that, that too many people are playing those games. And actually, if you do want to stand out, you have to do the opposite in, in many respects. You have to, um, <clears throat> you have to find another vehicle or lever to stand out and maybe longer form deeper storytelling is one. Um, the second thing I've got uh, more conviction in is what we discussed earlier, having that very clear common language, finding a voice that's ownable. When I look through the brands that we often champion, particularly today, think like Nike, Ryanair, Liquid Death, Duolingo, these brands that are really cutting through and connecting with culture and gaining all the attention. Um, they do good work and they do good tactics, but it starts with them finding of something that's ownable and it starts yeah. with them knowing exactly who they are. All of those brands I just described are very self-aware and then they're relentless and focused in showing up in a consistent way once they've found those hooks and those mechanics and those tactics and formats. So um, I'm very big on 
finding something that's ownable for you. And yeah. it starts with that self-awareness piece. And then the last thing is, I and we spoke about, again, we spoke about this today, but shiny new toys. There are so many of them and they are profoundly changing my work. They're changing our creative workflow. Yeah. They're changing the way we do um, insight, analytics. And a lot of people talk about efficiency, but God, these are these some phenomenal tools. And I think individuals, teams, brands, agencies, I think the ones that have a healthy obsession and find space to play are and are very curious. I think they're the organizations that are going to win, not just in the next 12 months, but I think for the next decade, the sure. ones that have that deep appreciation and lean into the to new things. So they're probably my three. That I uh, my marketing reflections of 2023, um, and it probably gives uh, you know a, maybe a good insight to how maybe I think 2024 is going to go. <laughs> yeah. In terms of, um, do you have any predictions for 2024? When you look ahead, marketing. What are like? Are we going to see any platforms regain attention? Are we going to see the death of any? You can't say the word threads. Um. You know, what are your predictions, 2024? So, th and this is, this is all this is a 2024 prediction, but also a bit of, I guess, like another 2023 retro is. Um, I definitely had my opinion changed on Instagram this year. I remember maybe start of the year, probably more last year. I I I, I think I posted about this, but uh, I felt like Instagram had a bit of a. Um, an identity crisis. It wasn't really quite sure what it was trying to be. It was, it became a bit of a mess UX wise, and it was trying a lot of different kind of product launches. None of the, none of which really working. I think the way that they have competed with TikTok, and I've seen the evolution of that product, the Reels product, in a way that is now almost uh, one for one with TikTok in terms of the algorithmic feed and in terms of the feature set. The parity there is is almost similar. I think the way that they have competed with TikTok is pretty extraordinary and they are now keeping up with them in a really meaningful way. And in general, Instagram as this kind of like all-in-one media app, I think is really, really interesting. And uh, as someone who runs an Instagram page, like I'm seeing growth that I, that I haven't really had before. And so there is ample growth opportunities on the platform. There are fresh new products. I think Reels obviously uh, really makes sense as a place to there's a space to play in because you can double up with TikTok and you have that double reach, but then you also plug directly into Meta's ad ecosystem and, you know, all of the products there. And um, I'm very, very bullish on Instagram. I think it's going to yeah. really compete with YouTube in its, in its, in its video, in a video sense. I think people are spending more and more time consuming video on Instagram. And if I was a brand that I, I didn't have a strong, you know, short to long form video strategy for Instagram, I would be thinking mm -hmm. heavily about that because um, it for me has been one of the surprises of the year that I didn't predict was how well they have um, built their product to compete with pretty much every other video platform. Hmm. I like that one. Can I ask you a question? This is like not related to predictions. Yeah. Um, what do you think of... What do you think of live? We may cover this for like another time because yeah. it's interesting. The the role of live has massively evolved and has a different purpose on maybe every platform. Um, do you think 2024 is going to be a breakout year for live? It's interesting. It feels like it live kind of sur you know surfaces repeatedly every few years as a as a topic of conversation. Maybe when a shiny new app comes out. I think live will always have the problem of being held back by the fact that you cannot create content as good as you can, you know, with editing retrospectively, and it takes the same amount of resources. So for brands, I think it's always going to have that, that kind of um, difficult place in your strategy because it's just harder to coordinate. It's harder to coordinate a live. It's harder to, to, to be polished about it. I've seen, you know, the places I have seen live really grow is when it makes sense. So um, 
you know, live sport watch alongs have exploded. You go on YouTube, any soccer game that's happening right now, you'll see 10 channels doing live watch alongs. And some of them have, you know, hundreds of thousands of viewers. Right. And so where it makes sense, right, where you have, you know, a live event that's happening and people want an alternative commentary from modern creators, I've seen live really explode there. And, you know, maybe in the podcasting space as well, where people want to see the, the, the raw recording. But outside of those, like I'd say, they feel like edge cases. It, it's always going to be a place I think that doesn't make sense for most brands to play in because they can craft better content without doing it yeah, live, yeah. and they could probably reach more people. And so there, there just aren't the benefits for me there yet. Um, so no, I don't see it being a breakout year for live. Okay, I'm disappointed. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really funny when. When we think of live, I, my mind went to a few places and um, I'll tell you my TikTok feed with live because, you know, TikTok just drops into feed um, random lives. And then if you yep. go into, if you select the live, then you'll just be stuck in a live feed, right? Mine is so random. TikTok, TikTok's yeah. got me down to a T when it comes to my general For You page. But when I get to For You lives, I keep getting hit. This is going to sound really odd, but I get hit with this... It's like hard techno music and Shit. like a thousand hamsters, like I say a thousand, it's like eight hamsters working out to techno music, but they're going, they're, they're all in one room and they go crazy. And there's a sign on the back that says these are fed. The hamsters can't hear the music. They're well treated. They're loved people. And there's like million, like I'm exaggerating here, but there are tens of thousands of people watching these hamsters spin. Like they're just working out and it's a live and yep. I get variations of that, really kind of random things. And, and I go, you're right. A, not a place for brands, but um, I think live is a weird and wonderful place at times. <laughs> but you, you made a point about kind of like sport events. Let's let's take what people expect. Where do you, where yep. in the entertainment sphere do you lose something? Sport is maybe one of the, only arenas where you kind of have to watch stuff live, really. Unless you're, like, addicted, it loses something in retrospect. Um, maybe, like, your favorite TV show that you're obsessed with, it maybe yeah. loses a bit of something if you don't have the kind of community dialogue that goes in um, or that, se that sense of belonging. But, yeah. Um, dude, I will give you my predictions for 2024. <laughs> and I'm going to go out with some strong, strong ones. Um, unsurprisingly, I think we're going to get the word AI fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> People will now be introducing and have already started introducing the word AI into everything. Um, I think by the end of 2024, we'll maybe stop using AI in the same way we stopped using certain terms in Web3 and crypto and blockchain and NFTs and just started talking about outcomes. I think yep. through technological renaissance, um, AI will lose its uh, appeal in terms of our vernacular. I think that's one inevitability. The other is, um, I tend to believe Snap may have a, uh, a a resurgence in certain respects. So one of the things about Snap, um, I'm not a Snap user personally, but I look around anecdotally and i see you know children within my family and like they have two destinations where they go and they go to tiktok or snap that is it they live their lives but through those two platforms and i often think it it's very wise to observe how young people behave yep. at and snap as a platform is probably out of every social media i know tiktok gets a lot of credit snap is probably being the most inventive in many respects, the origins of stories and ephemeral start on Snap, direct messaging disappearing, you know, they were way ahead of the curve of behaviors and tools and functions and features we didn't know we needed, right? In yeah. our social lives. They were the first to invest heavily in VR and AR and, you know, filters and augmenting the world around us. They very early on integrated a vertical feed that was built around Discover It. <laughs> around the same time as like as uh, TikTok. So I tend to think they get overlooked in many respects. But um I think Snap started I'm getting a newfound appreciation. 
because I think it's maybe got a bit more staying power than than some people once believed. That's fair. Yeah, it's a good point. I probably haven't opened the app in years, and I probably should. Sure, old, bro. You're old. Yep. You're not cool, but... fresh, and <laughs> hip like me. <laughs> and then um, I will give one more prediction. I'm going to give. It's more recently inspired. Pollyanna, who, who joined me last week, she gave a talk on CRM. Um, and you know me, I have a bias for creativity. So whenever anyone in marketing uses acronyms, I disengage. And she Oof. did a talk. I've never heard anyone make CRM sound as sexy ever Listen. and like as interesting. And I came out of her talk on CRM and just went, this is it. Brands need to pay really a lot of attention (laughs) and start really having an effective and modern CRM strategy. Um, One of the things that she laid out I thought was really interesting is the, um, you know, the ongoing developments around privacy concerns. So when Apple had their iOS update and, you know, if you ask, I think the data is now that like 92, 90 plus percent of people basically opt out given the choice of allowing... You, you know, to have a, a pixel track them on the internet, blah, blah, blah. Um, Google have given a period of time, and I think it's like November next year, whereby um, they will no longer allow any tracking. So there's been a that... big talk about companies having to have first-party data. You can no longer rely on the data that platforms have. You have to have own first-party data to make sure that you have a really ro- robust attribution model to make sure that you can continue to market effectively and measure your work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one of the things Pollyanna kind of kind of shared that I thought was really interesting is having creative strategies to collect first-party data, but not only first-party data, another term, zero-party data. Meaning, if you think first-party data tells me who you are and tells me, um, you know, characteristics of you as an individual, Zero party data tells me your preferences. You know, what do you like and those types of things. And if I think if you start getting creative in how you encourage um, and collect, and then more importantly, then use first party and zero party data, I think it's going to be integral. It's going to be integral in a cookie-less world, right? But- um, so for me, I go 2024, brands are going to have a serious look at their data strategies and their CRM strategies. Um, and yeah, I think they're my two predictions and hashtags will die. That's like a third. I've got a third that I just think hashtags are dead because they're no longer needed. We once used hashtags to categorize the internet. Now the algorithms are so good, they don't actually need you to hashtag anything to categorize yep. it for you. So I think hashtags are dead. So brands, stop using them. Agreed. Done. 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 Um, what way to end, dude? Um, good to see you, man. And I believe you're in... Are you Are you in London next week? I am not. I'm in... Um, towards the end of the week, I'll be back in Manchester. Okay, my man. Well, look, we'll do a, we'll do a final episode of the year next week, right? Yep. We'll do a final one, and then we're coming in hot for 2024. Um, don't forget your Christmas hats. Have a good week. I'll speak to you soon. Enjoy.